In November of 2000, a gang under investigation for a few botched armored truck robberies threw caution to the wind and went for a giant payday. The Millennium Experience, held at the Millennium Dome in Greenwich, Southeast London, was the target. The Millennium Experience shows off some of the most precious stones in the world. The vast array of wealth on display attracted the would-be robbers to the dome, but their ineptitude would, once again, be their demise. Lee Wenham led the gang of nine criminals. He owned Tong Farm, the gang's base of operations. Investigators believe that all of their criminal enterprises branched from the farm. The police tracked stolen vehicles there long before the robberies took place, but decided to wait for a more significant charge to land. The Diamond Heist wasn't their first attempted robbery. They tried to rob multiple armored trucks before settling their sights on the Millennium Dome. On July 7 of 2000, an armored truck left the depot carrying over 8 million pounds. The depot was 20 miles from Tong Farm, close enough to suspect Wenham and his gang. The robbery was surprisingly well planned, but it still didn't pan out for the crew of career criminals. They started the robbery by blocking off the truck's path with another vehicle. When they couldn't cut through to the cash in the back, they had another truck outfitted with a huge spike crash into it. The guards were helpless at this point, as the gang told them the vehicle had explosives attached to it and would blow if the guards even blinked. On top of this, they also cut the hydraulic cables, immobilizing the armored truck. After a couple of rams, they had punctured the armor enough to claim their prize. But just as they were about to taste success, the police showed up. Realizing it was over, they executed their escape by boarding a speedboat and speeding off down the Medway River. After all that planning and damage, the only thing they escaped with was their freedom. The attention that Wenham and his crew gained is what ultimately wrecked their plans. The police had constant surveillance and followed Wenham to the Millennium Dome when it opened to the public in 2000. The dome was home to the Millennium Experience, an exhibition to celebrate the start of the new millennium. It featured several exhibits and shows to entertain all of its patrons. There was art on display everywhere and plays held in the performance area at the center of the dome. Their own unique show with 165 acrobats and music by Peter Gabriel was performed almost a thousand times that year. After some financial troubles caused by low attendance put it in jeopardy, the dome had to rebrand. It was renamed the O2 Arena in 2005 and after some redevelopment was reopened opened in 2007 with a Bon Jovi concert. In 2017, they outperformed Madison Square Garden, gaining the title of the busiest arena in the world. So what did Wenham's gang have their sights set on? De Beers' diamond collection was kept in an exhibit inside of the dome. The exhibition featured some of the most expensive gems in the world. One of these precious gems was the Millennium Star. And no, it's not a silly mashup of the Millennium Falcon and the Death Star from Star Wars. It's the world's second largest grade D diamond. The Millennium Star is a flawless hair-shaped diamond and its grade comes from its complete lack of color. Here's a quick lesson in diamond color grading for you. D is the highest grade a diamond can be. That means it's completely colorless. Most diamonds contain a faint yellow tint. The more prevalent the tint, the lower the grade. The Millennium Star is insured for an astonishing $100 million, making it a prime target for the would-be jewel thieves. But the star wasn't the only precious stone in the building. The exhibit also included 11 blue diamonds, one of which was the Heart of Eternity. The heart exists in a class of rare colored diamonds. The De Beers Group purchased these gems over the years to add to their collection. De Beers is an international corporation that specializes in all things diamond. They have their hands in everything from the mining process to the retail part of the industry. Founded in 1888, the De Beers Group controlled over 80% of the diamond business and kept the monopoly going until the 21st century. The monopoly has since crumbled to competition, and De Beers now controls about 30% of the world's diamond market today. The police hadn't taken their eye off of Wenham and his crew since their previous attempted robberies. This attention followed them to the Millennium Dome after police got a tip of the upcoming robbery. London's Metropolitan Police had one of the most profitable robberies in history under their surveillance, entrusting the case to the Flying Squad, a specialist unit also known as the Robbery Squad. The Flying Squad is a branch of the serious and organized crime command and focuses solely on robberies. With their eagle-eyed precision, the robbery was doomed to fail before it ever began. There were a lot of unknown variables at the start of their investigation. They didn't know a lot about the thieves' plan, but they were sure about one thing, what the target was. The flying squad knew that the Wenham gang would go after the priceless jewels. To make sure they didn't get nabbed due to something unforeseen trick, the flying squad kept an ace up their sleeves, but we'll reveal that later. Under constant surveillance, it was easy for the police 
released to piece the Wenham gang's plan together. They were seen in the water across from the dome, practicing with a speedboat, proving that they would make their getaway on the Thames River. The flying squad determined what days the robbery might be attempted. With this knowledge, they were able to alert the dome's management and set up preventative operations. The attempts began at the start of October. They aborted their first attempt after their getaway speedboat malfunctioned. The second attempt came right after the first, but was called off because the tide was too low. After analyzing all of their activities on top of their failed attempts, the investigators realized the crew would make their escape at high tide. With this knowledge in hand, they determined when the robbery would be attempted again by watching for high tide. The gang's plan was like the opening scene of a superhero movie. A semi-coordinated gang of would-be thieves crashes through the walls and goes in loud. On November 7 at 9.30 a.m., a quiet morning was disrupted by a modified JCB earth digger, which is like a backhoe, crashing through the wall of the Millennium Dome. Four gang members, decked out in body armor and gas masks, rode the battering ram through the wall. These members were Aldo Cariocci, Raymond Betson, William Cochran, and Robert Adams. They drove the JCB right up to the money zone and went straight in. Once they made it inside, the gang all played their parts. Chiarochi started throwing out smoke bombs, while Cochran went straight for the reinforced glass protecting the gems. The glass was very strong and capable of withstanding a 60-ton ram, but the gang had planned for this. Cochran had a very high-powered nail gun that was popular in jewelry robberies at the time. He used it to punch three holes in the glass, weakening it so that Adams could smash it in with his sledgehammer. It must have seemed like everything was going smoothly to the Wenham gang, right up until they were swarmed by police in order to put their hands up. Had they snatched the jewels, they planned to escape in the waiting speedboat, riding the Thames River all the way to a multi-million dollar payday. Remember that ace up their sleeve? Well, before the gang got anywhere near the Millennium Dome, the flying squad replaced all the diamonds with replicas. If the robbers escaped, they'd be holding bags full of fake diamonds. So we wonder, why not let them take the fake diamonds and arrest them once they were all in the speedboat? The plan to stop the robbery was called Operation Magician. The police were beyond prepared for these criminals and quickly stopped their plan with no casualties. They had replaced all the dome employees with armed officers and waited for the gang to make their move. Once the chaos started, the officer's first priority was to deal with the grenade tosser and the driver of the JCB. He surrounded the machine and ordered Raymond Betson to get down. Betson stepped down from the JCB. He said that he didn't have anything to do with the robbery and worked at the dome. However, the police saw right through the man's blatant lie and arrested him. With two members in custody, the officers needed to apprehend the other two trying to break the glass. They did so by tossing stun grenades in the room and swarming the two criminals in full tactical gear. With that smooth arrest, Operation Magician was a success. Millman, the speedboat driver, was scooped up on the dock by an ambush team before he even knew it was happening. Of course, with all the evidence piling up, the police went and picked up Wenham later that day. Like sharks to bloody water, the media swarmed the trial to soak up every piece of the story. During the trial, Cockrum said, I couldn't believe how simple it was. It was a gift. I couldn't believe security was so bad. According to Cockrum, the body armor the crew was wearing was to protect them after the fact when they went to sell the jewel. The jury came back with a guilty verdict after a short deliberation. The judge spoke to the crew saying, you played for very high stakes and you must have known perfectly well what the penalty would be if your enterprise did not succeed. Betsam and Cochran got 18 years, while Kiriochi and Adams got 15. Wenham was sentenced to 13 years collectively for his crimes, and Millman died of cancer before the trial. With the sentencing out of the way, there was one step left to wrap this story up with a nice little bow. The flying squad's last target was a man named James Hurley, who just so happened to disappear right before the raid. The flying squad believed he was the real mastermind behind the entire plot, not Wenham. The police had evidence of him taking pictures of the dome from a boat on the Thames and dubbed him the Boatman. He was eventually located at Puerto Banus in Costa del Sol and arrested by Spanish police after a speedboat chase. Things weren't looking good for him until the Crown Prosecution Service withdrew the extradition order. The prosecution didn't believe there was anything to be gained by taking Hurley to trial after a similar case was thrown out. Old habits die hard, as they say, and this rang true for Raymond Betson. In 2012, he was arrested after fumbling his way through another robbery. Betson used a digger to rob a Loomis Cash Depot by smashing the machine through the wall, reminiscent of his previous work. However, he and his crew smashed through the wrong wall and found themselves in an empty warehouse. Then, after searching it and finding nothing, the criminals had to flee. Their getaway vehicle was found in a field with a balaclava and hairnet nearby in the bushes. Police used these articles of clothing to convict Betson with DNA evidence. In 2014, he was sentenced to another 13 years in prison. Click here to watch one of these next videos.